Where am I? Oh, there I am. Uh, at any rate, listen, we have a fantastic show planned for you folks. Uh, this is going to be something that I have been long waiting for. We had the uh, privilege of meeting each other when we went out to Santa Monica. Well, I, I think she was more or less in the area, and I was the one who did that travel. <laughs> but that being said, third phase of Moon brought the whole panel together. And uh, we had the chance and privilege to spend some time and have conversations. Now, I was very interested and intrigued when Apollo and I had gotten into some of the depth of the subjects that we cover. And I, I have to tell you, you're going to find out yourself this evening, if you're not familiar with this, this young lady, that she is well-versed beyond her years and completely multidimensional. This isn't just one aspect because people know her by and large, when we talk about our field of inquiry as a ufologist or a UFO enthusiast that I personally would call myself. But that being said, she is very well-rounded and has her own experiences that I'm sure she'd be happy to impart in way of anecdotal story or otherwise finding inspiration between the lines. Listen, I'm not going to keep her waiting too long, folks. I hope you're ready. As Third Phase of Moon says, buckle up, but you're probably strapped in already, sitting down. I hope you have a snack and a great drink tonight because it's going to be fantastic. Folks, without further ado, I'm going to bring on my friend, my colleague, Apollo Asteria. Hey, how you doing tonight? Thanks for joining us on the show. Hey, it's good to be on here, fellow uh, birthday brother. Uh, yes, for those... that's right. <laughs> We have the same birthday. <laughs> Pretty crazy. We That's share a right. birthday with uh, Arnold Palmer, September 10th. I didn't know that Arnold Palmer was uh, in that category, too. My goodness. Yeah, yeah. So ever since uh, I heard that, I, I drink Arnold Palmer's quite a bit now. I'm like, this is my drink. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's incredible. Uh, you know what's funny, too, is I, I, I of course, have mentioned to this to you in, in our uh, side conversations, my friend, good friend, Jared Murphy, you guys know him very well. He comes on the show all the time. He also shares the same birthday. So there's three Whoa. of us right now within Crazy. this inner circle that has that. And uh, it's just, you know, synchronistic, if nothing else. I think that there is an energy that has brought us together with third phase of moon at the helm, spearheading that energy. Um, let's get into your personality, your experiences, where you've come from. I know you've probably reiterated what you're going to say in many different forms on other shows, but for our listeners out there this evening, uh, tell me a little bit about where your interest in ufology came from, and of course, how did spirituality, in the way that you express it, work its way into your shamanic endeavors and perhaps something otherwise? Hmm, well, where do I start? I mean, you know, my whole life I've been uh, very into forbidden archaeology, lost civilizations, and ufology. And I've always been a huge reader. Like, literally, probably as soon as I could read, I was literally reading an entire novel, like, every night back mm -hmm. when I was in grade school, probably since, like, first grade. And my uh, it actually just so happens that Adventures Unlimited Press, which is the warehouse that produces all the books for all the people in the ufo kind of community and also is owned by the producer of ancient aliens happens to be in the middle of nowhere outside my hometown which is uh pure illinois so you know I, I grew up getting books from there all the time and like reading from people in the community and you know like i said I, there's just always been something there for me in regards to forbidden archaeology and lost civilizations and I feel that there's like a technology there's a lot there's more to human history than the you know textbooks claim there to be and I've just always felt that there's something there I don't know if it has something to do with past lives I actually feel it very much probably has to do with past lives but you know I just have a major connection with that and uh you know growing up I I just you know like I said I read all the time it was like you know all i ever did and uh, i started i joined the ufo community in uh about seven eight years ago after i moved to la i went to contact in the desert for the first time and uh you know i actually didn't really realize that all the authors i had been reading were there speaking 
And I get there and I realize that everyone's speaking there. It's all these authors I've been reading for years and I had no idea there's this whole like scene about it. So it was really exciting for me. And that's just kind of how I got into the UFO community. I started going to Contact in the Desert every year. And for those of you who don't know, Contact in the Desert is like the Woodstock of UFO conferences in Joshua Tree every summer. But unfortunately, they haven't really had it uh, in a few years. But also... Besides all that, I was also raised by a quantum touch energy healer growing up. Mm. Uh, you know, there's people in my family that, you know, did energy work. And, uh, you know, one of my one of my uncles actually does energy work. He's a hypnotherapist. He's a um, remote viewer. He does all these kind of things. So I kind of grew up, you know, really like everyone in my family kind of always told me, you know, don't don't trust the government, you know, they told me about HARP and all these different things, like, mm -hmm. from, like, you know, ever since I can remember. So I had a very interesting life growing up, and I had a sibling who went through a rare liver disease, and it was kind of this whole thing, and uh, I kind of learned energy work growing up through my uncle and dealing with that situation, and through things that happened in that situation, it kind of proved to me that, you know, that this sort of work is real and it, it really does work. And I've since uh, started a couple of different modalities. I've been uh, licensed in quantum touch levels one and two and the wonder method. And since, you know, I've kind of worked with other different modalities and uh, now I just kind of, you know, I don't, I don't really stick with any sort of modality. I just do what kind of feels right for me. But uh, with the, all that background, it kind of came together through my art, which is uh, shaman spears. I make these crystal spears Gorgeous. Uh, that channel energy. They all have copper coils, crystals, magnets, and sand I collect from sacred places around the world down the insides. And I paint crop circles on them that have also been found around the world. You can find those at <laughs> shamanspears.com. Uh, and I want to add you know, something to what you're saying with those spears. Uh, I had the privilege of holding uh, one or two of your spears out in California. And one of the th things that I noticed was just how energetic and vibrational this thing was. I mean, as soon as I held it, I could feel it in my heart chakra. And there was like some sort of electricity that sort of uh, rises within that experience. And you know what? This is probably what you put in there. Imbued power, imbued intention, love, light, healing, all these lighter vibrations that crisscross. And we see the physical manifestation of that with her art. And I certainly encourage you folks to go and check out her shaman spears and certainly look that uh, look at them up close. The detail is unbelievable. Sorry, go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> yeah okay so where was i going from there yeah so you know i i actually charge them all onto an energetic collective so every new spear i make makes the whole collective stronger it's kind of through the idea of quantum entanglement it's a method that uh comes through quantum touch and so i can basically every spear i make i charge onto this collective every person who has their own spear uh is actually and does channels energy with their own spear is also charging the whole collective and I've probably sold hundreds by this point because I started this about five or six years ago. So, you know, that's my whole journey with that. And besides all that, I've been an artist in the entertainment industry for, I mean, basically since I was 12 years old. But I moved out here to L.A. about seven, eight years ago. And I've been doing quite a bit of acting out here and I've been a part of a couple different music groups. One was like a multi-award winning band, but that kind of fell apart with COVID. Um, and, you know, besides all that, I, I did kind of start in the UFO community as a speaker or disclosure community as a speaker, mm -hmm. probably about five or six years ago. Um, that kind of came from selling my spears at conferences. And then, um, you know, people just kind of started. I just made friends with a lot of the speakers and they all kind of really liked my message and I ended up getting eventually asked to speak at a conference and uh, the presentation I got together is on Solutions for Humanity where I go over everything from the importance of full disclosure to space habitats, vertical gardens, circular communities, and basically every aspect of society. I just really break it down and it's really evolved over the past uh, five years and I'm planning on making a book about it, or I'm not planning, I'm doing it. It's coming together. So, um, yeah, it's, that's uh, pretty much it, I think. I don't know well, if I left anything out there. <laughs> you mentioned, you know, that healing 
seem to be a very big part of your upbringing. And of course, this conspiracies or the, the fringe uh, type information, your, your family sort of nurtured that within you. I mean, that's fantastic. And, uh, you know, obviously an advantage in certain ways to have such open minded people surrounding you in life. Um, can you give me an example or, you know, tell me a little bit of your experience in way of understanding how the healing energy works, wherein you were convicted, something that you did within yourself or perhaps working with another person, you saw a certain result that made you step back and say, yeah, this is something legitimate. There is certainly something to this. And, you know, with that in mind, I, I may even follow up uh, a little bit further and get deeper into the healing modalities. Yeah, of course. Um, well, for just a little disclaimer there for those who don't know, um, basically working with energy, they like to say uh, it's healing. You know, people like to see it as like energy healing, but really we like to call it resolving because you're not healing someone. You're through these different methods, you're basically giving them more energy so that they are able to heal themselves. Um, you know, we all uh -huh. humans all have the ability to heal themselves. And, you know, basically what you're doing is you're just adding extra energy. And this would be like chi life force or like love energy or in the star wars you would call it the force you know there's many different <laughs> names for it but it's basically just kind of channeling that energy and amplifying it in different ways so um you know as a kid like like i said my younger brother was born with a rare liver disease um he ended up getting a transplant when he was two but he was on a waiting list to get a liver for a year before my mom eventually was able to give him hers and it was like a really long process of, you know, it was kind of messed up because he kind of was like slowly, you know, not really having the best time for like a whole year. It was very drawn out, you know, he was kind of a major thing that was happening. And my uncle would work with him every day. By the time he got the transplant, they said that there's there was like no way the doctors said that he could have survived for that long and that basically his liver had oh, been wow. a rock. And my uncle had basically just been like sustaining it. You know, it wasn't even huh. working anymore. So that was the first thing that kind of proved it to me. And a little later on, um, I had a really bad kidney infection in high school. And I wasn't sure. I didn't know at the time what it was. And I literally could not even stand up straight. I'd never had a kidney infection, so I didn't know what was going on with me. I, I thought I was sick or something. I could barely stand up straight. My back hurt. I was nauseous. And mm -hmm. I went to my uncle and I was like, hey, you know, uh, I'm not sure what's going on. I think I might have to go to the hospital. But, you know, everyone in my family were like very against, you know, the pharmaceutical medical system. So, you know, I went to him and he just sat down and worked on me, um, you know, on my side. He, he just immediately knew he's like, OK, it, it's right mm -hmm. here. It's your kidney. And he started working on me for about 15 minutes and then. He was like, okay, now stand up and tell me how you feel. And I stood up and like the, the burning in my side was gone. I, I could actually stand up without feeling nauseous. I felt completely 100% better. And I was like, what did you do? <laughs> and he was like, uh, he was like, you had a kidney infection and I just cleaned out the bad blood. Um, so, you know, that to me completely proved it. And, uh, you know, I, since obviously through my own work i don't ever charge for energy work uh, i don't believe in that i know some people do but i just learned it just so that i can do work on friends or family if they're having problems or people around me and um you know i a lot of methods i really like to use have to do with uh emotional healing i've had a this is something that i do a lot of work with with the people are close to me and mm -hmm. um, one of them would be timeline healing. And this is a method that anyone can do, but I, I can show you all right now if you'd like to see it. Absolutely. Please okay, do. so this is something anyone can do at any time. And uh, this is a method I learned in one of my quantum touch classes uh, by a teacher. And so basically, obviously when you're channeling energy, you know, there's breath work involved, you know, you're kind of breathing energy up to your head and then down to your arms um, mm -hmm. with the, with this method. So, you know, it's basically just getting some good breaths in and really focusing the energy. And, and imagine focusing the energy in between your hands and just kind of pushing the energy together between your hands and just kind of breathe into that for a little bit. So imagine 
this okay i know this is kind of mirrored to you all right now but imagine your left hand is your past and your right hand is the present moment mm -hmm. so um take your hand and kind of imagine this hand is still here and just feel and feel if you feel any like, kind of bumps along this timeline so there's the timeline is oh. in between here and see if you can feel kind of any bumps in the timeline I'm so sorry, anywhere... my right is my past my right hand's my past uh your your left hand is your past okay sorry thank you right hand is uh present so anywhere you feel any bumps on that timeline you can kind of just uh you know breathe and send energy into that and obviously it's kind of a process but you know i'm just showing hmm. you all now and this is something a lot of people don't realize you know time isn't linear uh and you know so basically you can really actually change the past or the way you view the past or the way you yes. perceive it uh, with this method, it's actually an easy way to do it. It's like send energy to different moments in your life where you really felt that you were having a really hard time. And so my quantum touch teacher explained it when he was explaining to us all this method, he said that when he had learned it uh, a few years previously, he had, he had gone through a very bad breakup. And this was at, at a time where he had kind of started learning energy work, but he didn't mm -hmm. know a whole lot yet. And he said, he was having a really hard time. He was super depressed. And then all of a sudden out of nowhere, he just felt this waterfall of energy hit him of this, just this beautiful, amazing energy. And he just realized he's like, I'm okay now. And, but he was thinking, he's like, where, where did that come from? What was that? And then when he did, when he learned this method, he immediately thought to send the energy to himself in that moment. And then he realized that at that time, what he had felt was him from the future, sending energy to him in the past. So it's really crazy how this works. And it's kind of like, you know, what came first, the chicken or the egg sort of thing. So, you know, and this obviously can, gets into the Mandela effect and timelines and different realities and all that crazy stuff. But, you know, I've actually done this work quite a bit just for myself in my own life. And, you know, obviously it's like these things happen in your life. But really what you're doing is the, putting energy into the way you, you perceive them and imagining yourself as, you know, a, a child who just, you know, how would you treat a child in that moment? If, if you, you know, instead of how you actually felt in that moment, imagine seeing yourself as a child in that moment and how would you talk to them? How would you deal with them? And mm -hmm. so it's really, it's just a way of kind of seeing things in a different way and perceiving things in a different way. And if you send that energy into that moment, I promise you, you can really change the past. It's not like you know, maybe you're not physically changing it, but changing the way you perceive it really works wonders. And it's really amazing. I'm going to expound upon that just a little bit, because this is a, a, an area that I have always found fascinating. Now, I sort of discovered this perhaps in the same way that you did um, when I started working with energy healing. And of course, at this time, when I was 14, 15 years old, uh, I didn't even understand what Reiki as a modality was. So again, it was just energy healing. But the way that it was presented to me is exactly what we're talking about now. It's nonlinear. Uh, we're, we're looking at space and distance not being a factor as well as time, of course. And yet I thought, well, if that's the case, let me try sending energy to my future self. Okay, this is where I started. So when obviously at that time I was in high school, I'd be laying in bed at night. Uh, and before I went to sleep, I'd always try to do a little meditation. So what I started doing was literally blowing into this ball. And by the way, that that technique is actually how I use uh, I'm sorry, is exactly what I use to show people, you know, this external energy of sort or, you know, this free energy, but you took it a step further. I think that's cool. I'll, I'll have to ask you a little bit more about that. Um, but at any rate, I sent this energy to myself the next day, visualized myself full of buoyancy, you know, bounding down the halls, having energy, staying away, concentrating, getting stuff done. And I'll tell you, the next day, I would wake up more refreshed than I would ever have expected. Uh, it, wow. it would seem abnormal how much energy I had getting up because I am not really a morning person myself, but at this time, uh, I had no problem going throughout the day. Everything was smooth, fluid. It was like I had built a nice energetic foundation for myself. Now, I decided to take a step further and say, well, can I send energy to something that's already occurred, You know, perhaps a, a part of myself in the past? What I found in doing that is that not only can you 
send energy out there. You can influence, like you're saying, the way you perceive the event that occurred. So, for example, let's say I, I got hurt skateboarding. So, you know, maybe the knee got bruised or something like that. So I would send energy back to that point in time. And next thing you know, the knee would heal faster. You know, just a very small example of, you know, that echoing effect of putting forth that energy. Again, this is some serious stuff, guys. I mean, we're not confined by these limitations that we have been told and taught that we are. Even our own minds that believed those things and then continued to construct that reality, it's time to move it aside and contemplate something much larger than what we've already understood. That's fantastic. I'm really, really happy you brought that up. Yeah, you know, the mind is such a powerful thing. You know, it really comes back to the mind. Even if, you know, there's all these different modalities and, you know, you can learn all these. There's so many different healing modalities. But really what it comes down to is the power of visualization, the power of being able to center yourself and really, mm -hmm. um, you know, put energy into the present moment. And it's really incredible what can be done. You know, even like, you know, you can take that, you know, I know uh, certain basketball players have said, like, I think some famous basketball player said that he used to visualize himself shooting hoops every night as he was going to bed. And then in the morning, uh, you know, when he had a game, he would just, you know, shoot free throw after free throw or whatever, like all, all day. <laughs> and it's like, to me, actually with guitar, that worked for me with guitar a lot of times when I was in a band. Uh, you know, and I had, we were touring around and performing quite a bit. Sometimes I, my bandmate would, he would give us a song because, you know, usually the, the lead singer, he would get the song together. And a lot of times he would get songs together, like last minute and be like, Hey, I just finished this new song. It's awesome. I want us to play this tomorrow, the show, instead of the set we already had. And I'm like, dude, are you kidding me? <laughs> so we had to <laughs> learn this whole song, you know, and then. I'd be like, okay, um, you know, and just think about it as I'm going to sleep. Uh, imagine playing it, imagine performing it as I'm going to sleep. And then when I wake up in the morning, I actually have it completely down. My muscle memory can play it easily without even thinking about it. And it's, even, it's crazy. If, even if this wasn't something esoterically based, which, you know, I think we would find that there is something more quantum about this practice. Even if it was just a physical component a mechanism within our brain that was recognizing that's still super uh, powerful in, in so many different respects. The implications to still be able to create that reality are certainly there. Uh, one of the things I've noticed too is that when you get into that state where you know you were envisioning yourself playing the song and the guitar the next day and then when you go and sit down to do it and all of a sudden you start getting results there's this sense of oh my god you know, and, and it sometimes throws you off a little bit. You have to just relax and let it flow. And this is why I like to record a lot of practices, or at least, you know, when I was sitting down and playing all the time, that's what I was doing, just recording through the practice because there was guaranteed to be a point there that I played something uh, improvisational that I certainly could use or just came out of the ethers, if you will, couldn't remember it after the fact if I tried. So, I mean, I think the inspiration certainly comes in many different forms. Now, you've certainly traveled to many different places that are considered sacred and may even contain portals or vortexes the way we would describe them. What are your thoughts in general about Skinwalker Ranch with a mountain of evidence and yet still so many inconsistencies where an activity seems to spike and then wane intermittently? What are your thoughts on that particular location? Um, you know, I'm, I haven't been to Skinwalker Ranch and, you know, I, I've heard, a, I, I'm not going to lie to you, I haven't, I, I don't, I'm not super well versed in the topic mm -hmm. of Skinwalker Ranch, but I do know that, you know, there's these, there's definitely energetic portals that are found all around the world. And, you know, these places are very interesting because they usually, t it usually tends to have to do with magnetics. Um, I, I saw that there's been major connections with places that have, um, you know, very intense magnetics or places that have earthquakes quite a bit. A lot of this kind of seems to go hand in hand. And, you know, a lot of these places, if you take a map of like the missing 411 cases, I'm sure a lot of you have heard about that, uh, the missing 411 with all the national parks. If you take a map of all those cases and you put it over where, um, all the places are that seem to have like the mm -hmm. magnetics in the area are very strong um, and kind of go haywire. Uh, they're, that's actually, they're very much 
the same places. And also, you know, cryptozoology kind of events seem to happen in these kinds of places too. So, you know, it makes me wonder if uh, this is sort of an interdimensional thing that is going on here. I think it definitely has a lot to do with magnetics. Um, but, you know, I think it's very likely that in some of these places, maybe the, the door between our worlds or the bridge between our worlds is um, more more like a veil than like a physical door, if you know what I mean. Oh, certainly. And and actually, uh, Frapsap, Robert Rivas, and I were speaking about this on a couple shows ago uh, when we were discussing the odd triangle formations throughout the world that seem to have some of these hot spots of paranormal activity, uh, UFO sightings, uh, cryptids, you name it. Uh, everything seems to exist in way of that bag of tricks in one place. Um, I think it's very curious, and, and I'll put this out there once again, because some of these ideas are fun, but they're fleeting. You know, if we have something like that here on the planet, okay, and let's say that the planet itself is alive, which, you know, in various ways, scientifically, we can say this is the case, but I think there are many of us out there who understand the larger uh, picture of that. There are uh, arc fields, electromagnetic fields, and possibly a chakra system that can be defined within the celestial planet. If these are places of thinning within the veil on our planet, there's two thoughts that come to mind. Number one, other celestial bodies out within our immediate galaxy should exhibit the same characteristics and elements when it comes to these odd you know, formations and places of intrigue. Number two, if the physical, as a general rule, is a reflection of the internal, what does that say for us, our bodies, our whole auric field in way of these uh, what appear to be portals on earth is it possible that we could have uh, some sort of miniaturized version or uh, you know microscopic version of those portals within our auric field that maybe we're just not aware of you know I think the the saying as above so below really applies here and it really makes so much sense and you can see in so many different ways even when you look at um, you know, the different, supposedly the different species of aliens. This is one way I like looking at it. If you, I mean, I don't, I don't know if these are all real, you know, but it's like people have kind of put together this whole list of different alien races that are mm -hmm. commonly seen in abductions and things like that. And, you know, some of them look like praying mantises, you know, th th there's like, some of them look like birds, you know, there's like all these different kinds. And I don't know, I kind of like to think of that in this as above, so below concept but you know obviously we have these chakra these energy centers in our body the chakras and then there's these energy centers on the planet um you know which usually are at the intersection of very important ley lines and mm -hmm. you know these places on the earth are very powerful and amazing to go to and i've really tried to make it a point of going to every single one of these places i don't believe i've been to all of them yet but i'm almost there so what do you find <laughs> in way of consistencies with those places it, i mean do you find consistencies between those places oh yeah i mean in these kind of places obviously that's where the most ufo activity happens where the most uh you know just paranormal activity seems to happen in these kinds of places and it's just you know to me someone that's I'm someone who's very sensitive to energy and just going these places is just the most amazing, incredible feeling and just getting, I honestly, I've got a lot of really incredible downloads in these places. Um, you know, one of these would include, I, I've been to Egypt, I've been to Machu Picchu, uh, Peru, you know, these are both one of these supposed energy centers of the planet. Also Mount Shasta. Um, so, you know, these places, are a really amazing place to go to and just kind of really just kind of feel into the energy there and, mm -hmm. you know, really get downloads there. And uh, it's really incredible. And I think that, you know, it's really important for anyone out there to just go to one of these places or, or all of them at some point in their life because I, I think it's kind of important. I, I think it really... So, like, you know, these different energy centers on the planet, obviously, they connect to the different energy centers in our bodies. And, you know, say if you're having a issue with your heart chakra, then you go to the place that is considered, like, the heart chakra on the planet. And, 
you know, that can really help be a very healing experience for you. And I, I would definitely say that going to any of these places is a very healing experience. And it makes you see the world in a completely different way. It definitely breaks down uh, walls in your consciousness and can really mm-hmm. move you to a new paradigm just being there. I, I would assume that it's it's a very short-sighted effort to look at our lives and say, you know, we, we begin and we end, and that's it. We get one shot, one through. And, of course, this is, by and large, accepted vision, at least in the most pragmatic of views. Um, if we have these particular energizing stations or, you know, portals or vortexes that we can go and visit, and with this in mind, we're there to actually heal and help ourselves along. Not only can we put ourselves in these environments and experience a healing from something that's happened this life, but it can go much deeper into soul memory, uh, perhaps cellular memory. And of course, to talk about this, we're going to abandon a little bit of the rational side for a moment because we have to keep some things that are still unfounded and yet experienced right here in the front because it may be tomorrow that we have scientific uh foundation for what we're already experiencing. We're seeing that happen even in ufology. I mean, look at the 180 days of disclosure as they so uh, aptly named it. Uh, We did get something out of there. And and if nothing else, it's the interest, it's the awareness. And, you know, this might be setting up for what comes tomorrow. Yeah, I mean, I I agree. You know, it's uh, really amazing to um, definitely go to these different places and feel the energy in these places and mm-hmm. uh you know I, I i feel that um you know the pyramid of giza and these different locations are very important places in ancient antiquity because you know there used to be mystery schools that were in these locations um all these locations really were very important for spiritual uh gatherings in the ancient in the past and even now in uh, the Pyramid of Giza was a very important place for the ancient mystery schools. And, you know, obviously a lot of our secret societies in the present day have kind of evolved from these mystery schools that took place there. But, you know, these pl- schools were very powerful and, you know, it was all about life and death and rebirth. For the Egyptians, they felt that um, continuing on in the afterlife was very important to them and coming back, um, you know, and kind of incarnating in a way where as you die or dying with intent so as you're dying kind of going through a process and a purification process and coming back remembering who you were before was a kind of process that they learned in these schools that a lot you know people have mostly lost uh over the years since then but you know there were priests and priestesses who really um really worked on this knowledge for many, many years. And there were mystery schools where they worked on this and could actually kind of go into this like in between world, even in their Mm -hmm. dreams and, you know, leave their bodies and work on different, you know, patients. And a lot of the pharaohs actually had to go through these processes and go through these initiations. And these happened in the pyramids. Um, The pyramids were actually a way of basically shooting your consciousness up into the star systems because they believe that you know every king as they died they became they became their own uh star in the sky um but i would take that as far to say that you know i almost feel that maybe every person when they die they end up having their own star their own universe uh i think there's something really amazing about that and you know from my research i've seen that uh really the Pyramid of Giza it was really a, a very important initiation place where they built these. Um, it wasn't really a, to- a sarcophagus. It looks like one when you go in there. And I've been in there and mm-hmm. I've meditated in there. And the energy in there is really incredible. But really what it was for is when you lay down that sarcophagus, the acoustics of the room and the way the pyramid is built is so that if you meditate and you're kind of usually there's like a group of priests that kind of stand around and they tone to a certain frequency. And if you get to a certain place in meditation, either through an altered state or just through meditation, usually in like, you know, frequencies kind of mixed together, you can actually project your consciousness up through the pyramid. And that's what these were used for. And 
you know, they had uh, a lot of really incredible ritual practices where they worked on with this and supposedly, uh, you know, supposedly different amazing leaders from the ancient times, such as like Jesus and different prophets and, you know, different um, leaders from ancient times, like Herodotus and people like that. Many different people that we know of today, we still know now, went through this process where, um, you know, when, when they went through this alchemical pro process and actually were initiated correctly, um, they would be what was called Christic. And that was a way of, you know, basically expanding their consciousness and being reborn again in their own lives. So during their lifetime. So, you know, it was really incredible. And I think the Egyptians really understood something that was, you know, beyond what our society really understands now. And to me, the whole concept of reincarnation is very real. But there's a difference between, you know, living your... They, they saw it as, you know, generally humans will just live their life and they keep reincarnating. They work through these things over and over. Mm -hmm. But you can come into your life with more of a purpose, the purpose of basically living like a thousand lifetimes in one life and really taking every yes. aspect of your life and living it to the full potential and then dying with the intent of going through this alchemical process as you're dying to come back, um, you know, more aware, more awakened. And 100%. Sorry, go ahead. Yeah. No, no, continue. That, I don't know if you want to add anything on that. I mean, that's the perfect segue. I mean, you almost covered... Uh, the majority of what I wanted to bring up as well. I mean, this is so cool that uh, I feel like we're really on the same level here. I mean, you're bringing up the mystery schools, which is where we were headed. But, you know, this is my understanding of the mystery schools, I think, was uh, defined by uh, Horace, right? The right and the left eye of Horace corresponded mm -hmm. directly to these schools. Now, my understanding of the schools is very similar to yours. Uh, and, you know, through certain classes and levels, these initiates were taken through mental, emotional, and physical trials to uh, really build them up in way of confidence, understanding what intuition is, and not necessarily just on an intellectual level. There was uh, reportedly by drunk, uh, drunk, wow, let's try this again. Reportedly, Drunvalo <laughs> Melchizedek had said in his uh, first book, The Ancient Secret of the Flower of Life, that there were several of the temples that had certain chamber rooms wherein you would enter the room and you'd look down in front of you and all you'd see was this cut out in the floor and it'd be filled with water. The whole temple is dark, or at least within this room. You would jump down in this and you were told that you needed to swim out and you would kind of swim under uh, a pass and then you'd come out the other side. Now, what they didn't tell you is that when you got down there, it was incredibly deep, so it would take a moment to do it, and it was filled with live predators. I think in this case it crocodile. was uh, some sort of crocodile. Correct. So these are, you know, what they seem to be daredevil stunts to us today, but in fact they were strengthening the soul, the mind, and, and essentially as a result of that, the body as well, and bringing themselves into these situations and learning the left-brained aspect of it too really brought these people uh, as a culture into the spiritual space wherein they were living in the moment. They were still here, they were still present, but they were focused on how to orchestrate uh, just beyond the boundaries of this lifetime because they knew what they do here now uh, may affect with a great, great purpose another point in their existence and that knowledge really started to trickle down. You know, Pythagoras had uh, claimed that at one point Toth or Hermes, whoever you'd like to look towards the Greek or, you know, the, uh, the uh, Egyptian god, uh, actually took him down underneath one of these pyramids by the hand and enlightened him with knowledge of, you know, esoterics, uh, even in way of extraterrestrial connection, the history of our earth. And, you know, this is interesting to think about, that Pythagoras who we understand, you know, specifically for his math today, but, you know, he had other uh, philosophies that were involved in that, that this is where he claimed to get it. Now, it's also been said that he studied for 22 years in those mystery schools. So for them, this was something that was accessible even just outside of, you know, the immediate culture, if you will, which I, again, find very curious. But when you look at a chamber, like what you're describing here, uh, I understand, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, I understand that when some of these initiates would go into the final meditation, it was sort of that one last 
jump, okay, out into the ethers. You would literally project yourself out. Uh, if you were to look back, you may not even be entirely aware that your body is here and that you're still linked. But you were to go out, gather information, and then with the idea you're going to bring it back, anchor it in. And when you stepped out of that chamber after that long slumber, if you will, you were more enlightened and you embodied what we know as or deem Christ consciousness, you know, that higher level understanding. Um, in this effort, there was a very powdery white substance that would secrete from the pineal gland, which would come out the center of the forehead, obviously being the third eye. And this particular substance, I think we understood to be some sort of monotomic gold. Well, you were at the pyramids in searching, I'm sorry, in researching into the history and so forth. Did you come across this particular practice or what they had said? And before you answer, sorry, give me one second. Black Lotus Productions, thank you very much for the $5 super chat. They say, great show. Everybody smash that thumbs up. And I appreciate it when you do, guys. Thank you so much for that support. And of course, check out Black Lotus Productions on Sunday nights at 8 o'clock Eastern. I am on the panel and we have some fantastic guests. And also, Dorothy Hawkins, thank you so much for your support with the $5 Super Chat. Thank you, Michael and Apollo. It's great to hear more of your personal experiences here. Well, that's certainly what we do, and we'd like to corroborate it with something more grounded, but that's the whole idea, and in time, we do do that. Little elements come in, and we put them down, stake them right in, and we're building that foundation. Okay. Sorry. Go ahead, Apollo. <laughs> Okay, so, you Thank know, you I, I feel that uh, monoatomic gold, I know that was definitely used in the practices. Um, also, the blue lily, the blue water lily or the blue lotus, uh, you can see that in many glyphs in all the temples in Egypt. And, you know, by the way, these temples are amazing places. I mean, every single one of them, you know, you mentioned, uh, you know, some are in the mysteries of the Horus, but, you know, there's like, you know, there, there's the priestesses of Isis. There was a priestesses of Hathor, which was more of a sacred sexuality uh, practice. And the Temple of Hathor is a really incredible place. Dendera, um, that's the one that has the uh, what looks like lightning uh, light bulbs on the walls. They're like mm -hmm. working with these like light bulbs and everyone has these staves and the glyphs all over the walls. And these are really incredible places. But, you know, so what you were saying about uh, these processes of initiation that these people went through, uh, you know, I think uh, a lot of times it would have to be people that were from royal families that would have to go into this. But sometimes, you know, if someone showed a lot of potential, they would take them as well. But it usually had to be a process that people in the royal families would have to go through or people kind of higher up in society there, priests, mm -hmm. obviously. But, you know, I think uh, there were different ways of going through these initiation processes, like in the, at the Temple of Sobek, which was... A place that really stood out to me that was on right on the side of the Nile and if you look at photos of it you could never even really feel what it's actually like to be there J just from mm -hmm. looking at a photo you can't capture what it is from a photo it's so uh, huge and magnificent and I mean it's just a really incredible place and this is where they had the uh, crocodile initiation mm. the initiation okay. practices where basically um, I can't remember what it, either they had to like fight a crocodile or they had to like walk, swim through an area with crocodiles. Um, but usually, I, from my understanding, all these initiations were very much catered towards the individual. And it usually had to do with whatever this individual's worst fear was, was what they would have to face. Like some of them, you yes. know, it might have been cobras. So they would get put in a room full of cobras. And... A lot of times, you know, so they would have to, usually they would have to, before, from my understanding, they would have to go through a long process of being alone inside uh, one of these tomb-like places, uh, closed in in complete darkness with no sound, no light, complete darkness for usually, I think, like three days, a day or three days or, mm -hmm. you know, some length of time to where they very, really became in tune with, you know, with themselves and, you know, kind of let go of the rest of the world. And then they would have to go through this process of, uh, you know, facing their fear with, you know, whatever it was, like going through these different rituals. And uh, a lot of it also had to do with, you know, once they were able to enter that altered state where they were able to actually leave their bodies and actual project to, you know, the kind of in-between world. I, I forget what their exact name for this place was. Um, but once they were able to kind of leave and go through this plane, uh, I've actually read a lot of accounts of people who went through this and they had to 
they're basically in this limbo type world what we would see as like a limbo type world where they would actually have to go and rescue people that were caught in limbo um so mm-hmm. this would be people that had committed suicides you know people who had done pretty bad things in their lives but people that had been trapped there for a long time and needed help coming back uh i remember you know w- one story that i read was of someone who was just really attached to the idea of having a beautiful perfect home and just like this rich person who had this like attachment to having an amazing home and so in his limbo state he was caught in the state of uh basically every time he cleaned his home it would all fill up with dust again everything would break he would fix it, it would break again he was stuck in a weird limbo state with that um you know and it, so it's like everyone that's there they're kind of caught in their own state um so these initiates as part of this uh you know initiation they would have to go through is they would have to go to that world at one point and help bring these souls back basically rescue them from a limbo state and explain to them what they would need to do in order to move on um Mm -hmm. and that was actually the the priestesses of anubis were the ones that focused more on that um, from my understanding. And if you want to hear more about this, by the way, I highly recommend The Winged Pharaoh by Joan Grant. Uh, Joan Grant was this writer. She she died about 20 years ago, but she was this writer who um, was able to, she remembered all of her past lives, like in clear detail. She was able to recall them. It was something that happened over the process of her life. And she was actually very mm-hmm. good friends with like H.G. Wells and, mm-hmm. you know, um, all these, she grew up, uh, I believe her dad was like a physicist and uh, she grew up in a very interesting family and uh, in her life she learned through these different uh, scientific processes and uh, these metaphysical practices she learned to recall her past lives and she wrote eight books of entire memoirs of each of these different lives wow. and the winged pharaoh is the most interesting one it's actually the first one she wrote and it's um, one of her lives as a priestess of Anubis. And uh, it actually explains in clear detail her entire initiation process, what she went through. Um, in, it, it, it's really something that I recommend everyone reads because, you know, reading this and looking at it really shows the laws of balance and, you know, karma and how they play out in our lives. And even reading all the books, I highly recommend reading all the books, but in particular that one has to do with what we're talking about right now and you know i think it's it's just really amazing you know the egyptians really had a very advanced knowledge and uh, of these practices and it's really sad to me that it's been lost over time and obviously these practices are probably still held in mystery schools up to the present day but i i doubt there are a lot of these I mean, what they've evolved to now are obviously secret societies, such as the Freemasons Mm -hmm. and these different groups. But I, I believe a lot of them have probably lost this knowledge. Um, I'm, I'm not sure. I mean, I'm not a part of one of these groups, but you know, either a lot of them lost these knowledges or they've become kind of tainted with different, uh, you know, nefarious practices. And it's kind of sad, you know, I think if everyone on the planet really understood, um, you know, karma and these laws of balance and, you know, the afterlife, people would look at things differently and people would treat each other much differently. So oh, certainly. I don't know if that answered your question. Oh, <laughs> sure. I mean, it brought up a whole bunch of other questions, which is great, too. Okay. Aaron Morrison, thank you so much for your $5 super chat, uh, super sticker. Sorry. I appreciate your support of the show. Thank you. Another supporter of Dark Hour Paranormal. And in addition, we have Brian McAllister. What's going on, brother? He says, great show, Michael and Apollo. Thank you for your $5.27 super chat. I really appreciate it, guys. Thank you so much. Um, You know, these mystery schools purportedly were founded by Toth. Um, And, you know, obviously we understand him to be the god of wisdom, magic, the moon, and writing, just to, to start there. What... I'm curious of is the claim that some of the ascended masters who actually survived, and I'll I'll put that word in quotations for the moment, who survived the fall of Atlantis had actually uh, came from the center of the earth or wherever they were living in a cavernous sense uh, for quite some time to teach at these mystery schools. Have you heard anything along those lines in your research? 
Yeah, you know, I, I've definitely heard about, you know, those being um, underground and coming back at a certain time. And, you know, there it's interesting because there's actually what they call these 12 uh, sages or these seven sages um, that have been found in every ancient civilization around the world, like every ancient structure, um, you know, on different continents. Uh, it always depicts these seven sages or the apkalu or they have all these different names for them but there's mm -hmm. they're these bearded men with bags and it depicts them on gobekli tepe you know in um south america on different uh places there i think oyante tambo and different places in south america have depicted these people and they were supposed to be these people that came in uh right after the flood kind of came and brought knowledge on how to rebuild civilization to the people that were there and you know from my understanding i feel that at one time uh atlantis was what the planet was uh what humanity was as a seafaring uh civilization before you know atlantis fell i i think that you know there were probably very highly advanced civilizations that may have advanced in a different kind of technology than we have. You know, imagine if we had to start over and, you know, the people that the people that would be in like, you know, Silicon Valley and, you know, these kind of people probably wouldn't survive a huge cataclysm because, you know, they're not used to having to live off the land. It would be the people in like South America and the Amazon jungle that have don't even know that there are airplanes or cell phones, those would be the people that would survive. And I think that is very much the situation that happened at that point. And I think uh, some of these people were able, were uh, able to survive and were made to basically pass on the knowledge to future generations. So they had to mm -hmm. kind of, you know, come together and go to these different places around the planet and give them this knowledge. And it's interesting because you see it with, the way technology has evolved in human uh, society, it always seems to be like a lot will come in at once and then it drops off after a while. And then a lot comes in out of nowhere and then it drops off after a while. And it's mm -hmm. like, how is that happening? Like you can see this with the Sumerians, with the Egyptians, you know, all over the world. And it's like, it doesn't show a steady evolution of them like learning things and then attaining this knowledge and then it growing over time. It's always like, all of a sudden this knowledge appears out of nowhere and you know society evolves like overnight to become this whole other type of you know civilization and then it kind of drops off over time as the generations kind of forget the knowledge so to me that has probably a hundred percent to do with you know beings coming to our planet ancient aliens coming to our planet i mean i don't know what else could explain that so I think yeah. at some point there there may be less discrepancy when it comes to identifying an ascended master and an extraterrestrial. I think at some point, you know, yeah. there's a crossover here in definition. You know, the way we think about an extraterrestrial by and large is something much outside of ourselves. So much so that, you know, it's from a different planet and therefore there's every difference in the world between us. Well, we understand as we look around and really take a moment to observe life that we have a lot more in common with our natural settings than perhaps we were led to believe. So when you talk about knowledge that, you know, may have been lost, that, that's my understanding too, that they had a very large bulk of knowledge, we'll just say for the sake of conversation. And then throughout time, perhaps the way the world worked, I mean, I, I've generally... Uh, reference the yuga cycle with this I understand it. it is something more metaphoric but at the same time you know how do you quantify dips and rises in consciousness but yet it can mm -hmm. still be observed and you know that observation can be expressed within time you know so they did lose a lot of that from my understanding and what they had left went into those small uh, secretive groups such as the Freemasons or, you know, a certain shadow governments, different organizations that held on to this, at least in the beginning of uh, this decline, if you will, to preserve this knowledge for humanity. Now, what ended up happening was, you know, the human element got, excuse me, the human element got involved. And with the ego now driving, they decided that, you know, we'll be the ones to disseminate this information. And over time, they got to a certain uh, point where they said, okay, maybe there is a dip 
going upwards in this consciousness, we can either disseminate some of it lightly and gently, or you know, we can reserve you know, for that time that we feel is right. So there are groups out there that still hold some of this knowledge, but yet all you need to do is to have one peek through the cracked, uh, the cracked door, so to speak, to understand what's inside the room. And what's inside the room in way of knowledge is everything that is natural to us. It's our right to remember, not just to have it or to learn it. It's not about that. It's about remembering that true self. All of this knowledge that we talk about, yes, it will bring you on fantastic journey and inquiry, but really in the end, what does it do? It brings you back to yourself, which is then reflected in the whole, which is then reflected back to the self. I mean, this is so unique to me and so paradoxical because we are literally all one energy looking back on itself saying we're one energy instead of just having the knowledge that we're one energy. I find that incredible. You know, in, <laughs> in way of, the, in, of what ancient civilizations may have had uh, for knowledge, you know, certainly there are people still working with that today. And of course, you can find consistencies and reflection in other cultures that may have gotten their knowledge from some line from the Egyptians or prior to Sumerians, perhaps wherever it came from. But long story short, even, you know, medicine men and uh, men of knowledge when it came to indigenous tribes still hold on to a certain um, bit of information that if perhaps presented to the wrong person, it's so naked and vulnerable that they could misuse it. Uh, just like if you and I understood all of a sudden tomorrow that we could move things with our mind with great ease, you know, maybe uh, somebody who has that, that ability will say, okay, well, I got mad at this person today, so I'm going to, you know, take his shoes off while he's sitting there in the meeting. You know, you could get yourself into trouble with this, I would say. So maybe to protect us, that's what their initial thought was to, to withhold this information. Now, that brings me to uh, a very interesting concept, and that is that people have often said that there was a room underneath the Sphinx uh, paw. I think it was the right paw, if I'm not mistaken. And this particular room essentially had a, an Akashic Record stronghold or some sort of Halls of Amenti uh, reflection wherein all this information about our history, our true history, the science and the nature of it, it's all there. Now, it's also been said back in the mid to late 90s, I believe it was, that this room was discovered. And the way that this door was opened was that there was a very specific person who have, had to really hap upon it. Okay, maybe they were going there to visit. Maybe they had prior knowledge of what they were going to do. But with this, it was a vibration that opened the door. Have you heard anything about this or uh, had any research or experience with this particular concept? Well, I want to bring this back to, you know, what we were saying earlier in regards to as above, so below, mm -hmm. uh, you know, I, I feel that, you know, obviously many cultures talk about the uh, Akashic records or the halls of Amente. It's a different kind of word or it has a different term in every culture. But, you know, there is this knowledge that we that is kind of you know i guess you could say inside all of us that we all deserve that is basically our antiquity and uh you know our our right as uh humanity to have this knowledge but at the same time i think it's also reflected in a physical form on our planet and i've heard there are different places for this so one would be below the paul of the sphinx uh, my friend Michael Lee Hill, who I interview quite a bit, has done some work with Native Americans and triangulated a place in uh, East Lake, Ohio, I believe it is, where they hmm. believe to have found another one that uh, the Mayans had put there. Um, or, you know, whoever came before the Mayans, I guess. And I believe there was one other, a third place. Um, I can't remember. I think the third place they were saying was somewhere around the Panama Canal or something. I can't remember. But... Um, you know, I, I think that, you know, like I said, I think there's like a metaphysical reflection of this and a physical reflection of this. And obviously, you know, there's the, someone mentioned earlier in the comments, there's a the library of Alexandria, all that knowledge was supposedly lost. But from what I've heard, it was actually, they had only burned the tax records and, uh, the rest of it ended up going into the Vatican. So, mm -hmm. you know, the obviously the vatican does kind of hoard a lot of the knowledge from all these cultures uh there's been you know a kind of fit, common thing where when conquistadors were sent out they would you know take the books 
uh, from these and tablets from these different civilizations and bring it back there and say that mm -hmm. it was burned, you know, but it wasn't ever burned. And, you know, that's kind of maddening, but at the same time, it's like, okay, like, you know, it's frustrating to think like, you know, this is happening and this knowledge is hoarded from us. But at the same time, all this knowledge has to be in us somewhere, you know, we can, you know, whether it's through meditation or, yes. you know, there's, there's a way to unlock this knowledge in all of us. And I, I think, uh, you know, that's going to happen at a certain point when the human race is really ready for it. Um, you know, like you were saying, it could be dangerous if, for if people that are at the wrong stage of their evolution, their conscious evolution, and are mm -hmm. kind of very weak individuals, and then they happen across this, it could be dangerous. So, you know, maybe there's something to do with that where it, it's like humanity needs to evolve to a certain point consciously before they're ready to have this information be revealed because we can't right. have people that are you know not really um very good individuals i guess malevolent individuals having this kind of uh information or abilities so i don't know but it, it's definitely really fascinating and i do know an archaeologist who did d dig at the paul of the sphinx he said he went down through several layers Mm -hmm. And this is Larry Dean Hunter. He's done a lot of work there. I haven't spoke with him in a while, but the last time I spoke with his assistant back in, I believe it was 2018 or 19, 2018, I believe it was. She said that they had dug through several layers of the Paul the Sphinx, like several layers of civilizations. And they got to a certain point where there was a... Um, they found something down there and apparently they had found these giant skulls these elongated giant skulls yes. and a lot of other things and she said that as soon as they found it the head of antiquities who is very corrupt uh sent in at the time i don't know if he still is i, I don't think he still is but at the time this guy was very corrupt hawas he sent in his team and they made uh larry dean hunter's team leave and his team came in and basically exploded through in dynamite and exploded uh, the dig site. And everyone, actually a couple of people there died from my understanding. And hmm. that was the end of that. So I don't know. Um, but also, also under the pyramid, there are tunnels under the pyramid. And under the whole Giza complex, there's these tunnels. And... Uh, I know a couple people that have been down under those as well. And they say that the tomb of Osiris is supposedly under the Great Pyramid. And um, some other individuals are buried down there as well. But, yeah, so, I don't know. I think, uh, you know, obviously these things are kind of hidden. And, um, yeah, that's that's all I really know from my understanding. I, I think it's really, it's just uh, hu humanity really needs to evolve to a point where they are able to you know have this information where they're consciously ready to have this information revealed to them you know on one hand i can see you know the hesitation to release everything to you know the public at large i mean can you imagine some of these power hungry politicians using thoughts manifest at the level that it happens instantly uh you know we might all be dead in a matter of just mere moments um you know, I do understand that, but you know, it's it's sort of playing both sides of the field because yet it is our right to at least have enough information that will propel us along our evolutionary journey to eventually ready ourselves to withhold that type of information. Now, the thing that really gets me too is that if this information is intrinsic, it is natural, then we eventually, par the course, if we don't kill ourselves, will remember it. And so what would we look back on in an age like today, wherein we have these watchdogs holding on to this information, perhaps in the best of ways, perhaps uh, in the more selfish of ways, if you will. I don't know. It's going to be very interesting. And it's odd that people think you can get around this by just hiding it, because eventually the glaciers will always melt. You know, it, time goes on. Things change. Entropy is at the forefront eventually you're going to see what it is. Now, maybe your generation might not be around. It may be hundreds of thousands of years down in the future, but eventually humanity will know how much we have deceived, manipulated, and lied to ourselves to keep ourselves from moving forward. That's what's happening here. 
Yeah, you know, I, I think, uh, you know, there's some information that I think we should know, you know, and then there's some things where it's like, you know, when, what we're talking about with abilities, I think it makes sense with that aspect. Those things, you know, probably need more time to be revealed. But in regards to, you know, these ancient civilizations that were here on the planet, uh, you know, these books that were burned at the Library of Alexandria and, you know, uh, that that to me is not okay. <laughs> Those no. things should definitely be released because, uh, you know, humanity deserves this. This is our these are our ancestors, and um, you know, it it's our um, I don't know what the word is it antiquity. There's a certain word I'm looking for, but uh, mm -hmm. it's it, our inheritance, I guess. Um, mm -hmm. You know, and we deserve to know what our history was, and. You know, obviously, there's these giant skeletons that are destroyed by the Smithsonian's hashtag Smithsonian Gate. Um, you know, so there's so much going on, and there's certain things that definitely do need to be revealed. So I will clarify that there's definitely things that will uh, do need to be and should be revealed and shouldn't have been kept secret this whole time. And you know, it's like why the secrecy in the first place? When did this happen? There was a certain point where. You know, obviously there were glyphs. There's glyphs on all these ancient temples around the world of you know mm -hmm. people with extraterrestrials and you know send you know a lot of different things that were happening and they were I, apparently it was very common knowledge. You know because it's just written all over the walls in these ancient temples and it's like at what point did this become lost? Right. Um, or shrouded so at very least. Yeah. Yeah. I mean it's it. I don't know, but I would surmise that there may have been an element of preservation when they were creating these, not necessarily just for the uh, attention of their society and culture. They were already thinking well beyond what might be coming for this world, or perhaps they knew that we would lose a lot of this information, and what they could do was to chisel in these hieroglyphs and petroglyphs and at least give us a, a, a fighting chance at remembering without holding our hand the whole way. Because, you know, remember that we're not down here just for the handout. If you were to incarnate and then all the answers given to you, uh, it'd be a little easy. You know, there are plenty of times, and I'll equate it like this. Okay, let's say I'm out skateboarding, and I want to learn how to do a kickflip. Personally, as I've done, you know, these sort of practices before, learning how to do something, getting the dexterity to that particular uh, item, I've found that I've had more fun learning how to do it and failing along the way because every time I would, I'd have a different angle to approach. And there were occasionally, I actually caught myself after a while, I, I wondered what was going on. I was actually keeping myself from landing the trick or accomplishing what I was doing because I was having so much fun just going through the process. So, you know, it's not about just the end point. Obviously, we hear the old adage saying, you know, it's about the journey, but it really is. And in that, whatever we're recording within ourselves, we are at least compiling in way of some sort of overarching consciousness wherein today, if you wanted to know something and you had the withal to do this, and you all do, by the way, Okay, we each get our, our separate avenues of getting there, but we all have the capacity to do this. Sit in the silence, ask your question, and listen to the answer. Now, it may not be exactly what you expect, or it may be far exceeding your expectations, but literally, that's all it takes. Now, a lot of times when you get that answer, it might not be the complete answer. Dronvalo Melchizedek often spoke about how he was visited by certain archangels or very high vibrational energies that would give him a symbol or a design and they say here figure it out oh well which way do I go not for us to figure out it's for you to figure out and sometimes he spent years researching trying to look into the geometry of the design and you know it would be some time later that he could connect what it was but it took time and of course in that that process he learned a great deal which he actually compounded and looped back around and it just fed back into itself in everything that he was doing. So again, just to bring it back to that point, you know, it is about the journey. Uh, if we were to have all the information at our fingertips right now, we, we wouldn't have the experience that we're having. I'm not going to sit here and tell you there aren't times that I don't enjoy not knowing something. Uh, the world is very overwhelming. There's a lot of stimuli coming from all different directions. If we were open to all of it all the time, can you imagine hearing what the sound, the din of, of the earth with everybody you know, in their joy and their sorrow, coming in and out of existence, if you could hear all of that at once, 
you know, what that would sound like. It'd drive you mad. And to try to discern a certain voice from that, those masses would be even more difficult, I would imagine. But again, we're looking at this from, you know, the tools that we have now, what we think we understand, and how we may be moving forward with this information in our hands. The Healing H Art Psychic Medium, thank you so much for your $5 super chat, Michelle Gray. Very, very happy to see here, uh, see you here on the show. Of course, Michelle and I have done several shows together along with Elisa Madhus. Please go ahead and jump into the archives and check out those shows because she is fantastic. And of course, if you ever need a, a good solid reading, Michelle Gray of The Healing H Art is the one to go to and I highly recommend her. In fact, I don't want to go to anyone else. Let's put it that way. Thank you so much. And just to say, Azur Sky, thank you so much for the $4.99 super chat there. I saw that you were having a little difficulty getting that uh, uh, together there and wave the super chat. And I appreciate you moderators, Cashew and all the others. Thank you for guiding her the right way. Nothing but love for beautiful truthers, even when it's not so beautiful. We need you. Wish I could give more blessings to all. Hey, listen, you being here in attendance, watching the live show. Yes, I, I certainly enjoy the monetary gain, but it means more to me that you're here participating in the show. And I mean that wholeheartedly, folks. Thank you so much for your support. Uh, listen, Apollo, I've had a fantastic time. I know uh, Rich has just gone on to goof on. Usually I go a little bit longer, but I don't like stepping over his show because I know we do share some of the audience. And uh, I just want to remind everybody that Apollo did appear on goof on last Friday. You can go a couple shows back in the archives of goof on and find this fantastic show. Absolutely fantastic show. Rich has some of those uh, inside questions that he just flips out off the cuff, and Apollo did nothing more than stand her ground and then create the earthquake underneath that kept us all interested and engaged. Definitely go and check that out, guys. I really appreciate it. Uh, listen, I have your links to your Instagram and your channel, Apollo's Odyssey, in the description below. Where else can we find you, Apollo? Oh, if you could please add the uh, my Shaman Spears website there as sure well, www.shamanspears.com. That is shamanspears.com. I'm getting all my new products up uh, in a few days here, the next few days. But uh, I mm -hmm. still have a lot already up there, and that would be much appreciated in funding my journey here. Uh, oh, but will. yeah, it was really great being on your show. You know, I enjoyed being on Rich's show the other day, and so definitely yeah everyone go check that out and tonight's show you know we we definitely got into you know i like to say in interviews it's like everyone has keys in them and a lot of times when i come into an interview it's almost like we're like unlocking each other and different things mm -hmm. come out that you wouldn't even know was there and it just kind of comes out and it's really fascinating so i really like what we kind of uncovered in tonight's interview I really enjoyed it and i appreciate you having me on no, the thanks is all mine. Listen, it was an honor to have you here. And, you know, for all intents and purposes here, uh, I really didn't want to dive into what you're most known for. And that is, again, the ufology uh, side of things. I mean, we've, we've spoken in many different formats, but I, I wanted to get a little bit something different in the way of your interests and what you do. Because, again, you're so diverse in what your, uh, your research and your journey has brought you on. It's just absolutely staggering and quite remarkable, to say the very least, Apollo. Well, I really appreciate it. I've definitely had a very interesting background, so it's fun to be able to share the different aspects of that on tonight's show. So I really appreciate well, it. Thank you. Well, thank you very much. We're, we're definitely going to have to have you back at another point. I mean, I think I went through probably a third of what I had planned. That's always what happens, and that's always a good sign. Uh, the show hey, flew anytime. by. Anytime. So, oh, thank you very much. I appreciate it. All right, I'm going to bring you in the back. Uh, if uh, you have to go, I understand. If you, you can, I'll stick around to say my proper goodbyes, and I'll be back there in a moment, okay? Sounds good. Cheers. Thank you. Oh, wow. Man, this uh, interview exceeded my expectations. I mean, I didn't go in there with too much because I know that there are so many different paths that we can go down when it comes to talking to Apollo Asteria. Uh, this was just certainly something I have been looking forward to and uh, I'm not gonna lie I'm not gonna lie I was a little nervous in the beginning of the show I was a little nervous yeah me believe it uh, you know but that's what happens when you're up to such great energy and Apollo certainly exudes that 
absolutely fantastic. Hey, Misty OC Dragons, well, Mysteria Dragonheart, this time, thank you for your $1.49 super sticker. My God, I think I see you do it twice. I don't know if that was a mistake, but uh, thank you either way. And guys, really, thank you so much for your support tonight in the Super Chats. The moderators do a fantastic job. Uh, you guys are just awesome. I saw so many of your lovely faces here tonight. I really appreciate you coming by this evening. Uh, we do have a few things on the burner here. And of course, I'm going to wait to announce that for the rest of the week, see what comes in. But of course, in the meantime, you guys got to stick around because there's much more to come. My God, it's pouring outside right now. Unbelievable. Well, at least it's not snow yet, right? We're getting there. All right, everyone. Thank you for tuning in to Dark Hour Paranormal tonight. Once again, go and check out Goofon. He'll be, well, he's on right now. And uh, please go and check out Apollo Asteria's channel, Apollo's, uh, Apollo's Odyssey, over there on YouTube. And check out her Shaman Spear shop. Again, I will put that link in the description below. And again, highly encourage you to go and check out her wares. Absolutely fantastic work that she does. Uh, until next time. Stay fascinated, stay intrigued, and stay buried deep within this nebulous field. I'll see you next time, guys. Ciao.